for December. Winter is finally here. Uh, we're a little bit spoiled, I guess, this fall with 60 degree weather and things all through the summer. Um, um, so today we're going to focus on living streets. Um, I think this is a really important topic as we um, think about the development of our cities and how we want to make them more livable for the people who live there um, and allow that, that mobility as well and, and thinking about those two things together. Um, best practice 11, and we're really going to dig in on um, uh, a couple of those actions that are within that. So we have Emily Gellner of ULI um, and uh, Hannah Pritchard with School Design who will be presenting today. I'm super excited for them. They're going to be, they're going to be great with tons of useful information um, that you can take back to your cities, especially as many of you are preparing for your comp plans and how you think through that and, and incorporating some of these ideas into those. So, um, so we'll get started. I think first with introductions, it's always good to get a sense of who's in the room. Um, and a little bit of an icebreaker, I want you to think about what characteristics of a street are uh, a certain appeal to you. What do you like about a street? Um, so I'm Abby Finnis, and I work at the Great Plains Institute, and I'm also co-director along with Philip Music of the Green Step Cities program. And I think when I think about streets, I think it's, it's, it's not a complete street if it doesn't have trees um, and mature trees, and that kind of brings everything together. And, and you know, there are, I could go on about trees and all the benefits that they bring. Um, so for me, tree line streets really tie things together. So, Hannah? Uh, I'm Hannah Pritchard with Tool Design Group, uh, traffic engineer there. Um, I also was going to say trees, and also we'll probably say trees later. So I'm just going to go with another vote for trees. Right. I'm Emily Gellner. I'm both here at ULI and work for City of Gold Valley. And I'm a fan of streets where I feel like I can see everything around me and I can see what's coming. So really fast traffic on a really wide road is not my favorite kind of road. Hi, I'm Katie Hosh. I'm a Minnesota Green Corps member at the Great Plains Institute. And when I think about streets, I think of water infrastructure that often goes along streets and how that correlates to residential and the aging infrastructure system and things like that. Um, my name is Katherine Phillips, also at the Great Plains Institute. And I would say that I like roads that curve. <laughs> um, my name is Patrick Boylan. I work for the Metropolitan Council as a sector representative. Um, I'm going to go with maintenance in the sense of um, street sweeping, not for what I'm a bicyclist and I'm a skater, and I like to not slip on gravel and sand and things like that. So I think it's great to have good streets, and I think that's a piece that is sometimes not thought of. Right away. Skateboard or rollerblades or? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Nancy Rose, and I'm the Park Conservation Executive Park. And um, I think I'd echo business about all the trees and water. It's well maintained streets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and every time we say trees, we all have to plant a tree. <laughs> 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 I'm Sarah Grace from the City of Arden Hills, and I would say safety. Rich Goman, Arden Hills, and we're going to build a street from scratch next year. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm Connie Wixalan with the City of Waker Lake, and I like the tree idea, but also to use it for stormwater management, potentially, and pedestrian friendly, and the rain garden with that picture, I think, is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm Kate Qualley from the city of Sydney. Um, since everybody said probably what I would have said about trees, um, living streets to me means um, whose who's priorities, who, who is using the street? Is it the people of the city? Is it the people that are traveling through the city? Um, whose minutes are more important when crossing? whose safety is more important, vehicular traffic being able to go faster, or pedestrians and bicyclists, though fewer in number, trying to get across. And so the mix of things and the, the number of governmental jurisdictions to create living streets that have diametrically opposed opposing views on what the answers to those questions are. That's, that's something I think about a lot. Yeah, that's really great. Peter. Good morning, Peter Lundstrom, Clean Energy Resource Teams, and Mayor of the City of Falcon Heights. And I'm a biker, so I think about shoulders and bike lanes. 
Gary Johnson. I'm a professor of urban forestry at the University of Minnesota, and I know you expect me. As I am the way I am, I refuse to say streets. Uh, I look at streets as more intimate parts of the neighborhood and not necessarily the fastest way of getting from point A to point B. Uh, uh, my name is Danielle. I'm Around and sort of feel like living your lives and working and shopping and going places where you do feel like you're part of the American system. And so I often will do a surface street instead of uh, freeway whenever I can. You get that out here. Uh, so I'm using, uh, I work over at the MPCA and I coordinate the Peace of Space program. And, um, uh, you can tell it's Minnesota because no one has mentioned sidewalk cafes. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I grew up in Los Angeles. So I think it's sidewalk cafes. And multiple door openings. Actually, my, my daughter works in San Francisco for Jan Gale, who's a Danish urbanist. Jan Gale has this concept of the Gale Door Index. Or so you're walking down a, uh, an urbanized and mixed use area. How many sort of door openings? How many different Entrances, empty building structures. Those are the chairs, tables. Mike McGillie, I'm a city planner for the city of Big Lane. I guess I think a lot about pedestrian friendliness and psychological cues. You know, large surface parking lots right along sidewalks. Nobody wants to walk by a more attractive building facade. Everybody wants to walk by. I'm a head resident, I'm a sustainability consultant and architect. I also sit on the environment commission and I agree with all the comments and all I have to do is I think of streets in terms of connectivity, but beyond the uh, sort of traffic connectivity, the idea of connecting community uh, as well as uh, walking down a good street well tonight, uh, connects you with uh, a sense of community as well as a sense of um, the earth as a natural and the opportunity for discovery that comes through history comes through. Um, I'm Hannah Gary. I'm a Minnesota Green Corps member with the City of Gold Valley. And I like trees and bike lanes and everything that everyone says. But uh, as someone who grew up in Minnesota, I love streets that are clear and have snow. <laughs> 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 and, um, <laughs> I'm Chris Rose, I'm with the City of Old River, and I've been working on the project. One of the things that she found was this hierarchy of organ or planning for streets and for pedestrians and bicyclists, and cars also, looking at those that are actually on the sidewalks and on the sides of the road a little bit more than the people that are great. Thank you all for sharing. Turns out nobody likes high volumes of fast moving cars. <laughs> 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 uh, I also want to say hello to everybody uh, on whatever is in the cyber world on the webinar. Um, which you can share your, your your streets with us, um, but we don't have that two way technology going just yet. Um, for those of you in the room, feel free. There's snacks back there. We got some peace coffee, um, so help yourself. Um, and then there's also a bag for compost, and I think everything that we have is compostable, so just go ahead and throw it in there. Um, let's get going. Uh, so living streets are best practice. You know, it's just really creating that network of complete green streets um, to improve the quality of life, and, and you can increase the value of surrounding properties. And there's a number of other co-benefits that go along with that, and I'll get into some of that. Just touch on it, and then um, let our presenters take it away. So we're going to dig into 11.4. Um, um, and making that, thinking about that connectivity, where are there gaps in our streets and, and, um, and our mobility, um, particularly the sidewalk, and then uh, traffic calming measures in 11.6. And if you think traffic calming is boring, I promise you won't at the end of this. Um, so why why are we thinking 
about this. Um, you know, there's a number of benefits that go along with it, but there's also um, safety issues. And here you can see sort of the, the bike and pedestrian fatalities in Minnesota over the last 10 years or so. And what I don't have up here is 2016 is actually way higher, and we're already at 55 uh, pedestrian fatalities for, for 2016. Um, so we're uh, on pace for a record year, I think. Um, although what you're not seeing here is the 10 years previous, the average um, pedestrian fatalities in Minnesota were about 48 people annually um, in the previous decade, and they're about 35 years. So it is going down um, as we go, but you know, the spikes that we're seeing lately, they attribute, I think, to distractions of your cell phone, and then all the things that are going on in your car, there's so many buttons to push, and connecting your cell phone to your car, and you know, so many different ways to get distracted while you're driving. So, um, you know, there are things coming along with autonomous vehicles and whatever that may remedy some of those issues. Um, yeah. Um, anything held constant or any sort of measure of the number of pedestrians and bicyclists year to year? Because I mean, this isn't. If we have five times as many people, then that's sure. 40 people. Sure. Sure. There, there are stats per capita. Um, uh, I didn't grab that, but there definitely <laughs> just, are. Just yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, generally, it's going down, but there's still safety issues. Um, and actually, we're in one of the most dangerous times of the year when we change the clocks back, and we're not used to it to being dark in the evening. It gets it gets more dangerous for pedestrians on the street and some of the dark. Um, so what are some of the benefits of having living streets? Um, you know, it's improved safety for users, it's more access to different kinds of transportation. You don't just have to drive, you can walk, you can bike, you can take transit. Um, it's healthier if you're doing those things and you're not in, in your car all the time and you're moving more. Um, and then you can cut costs by by not driving as much, and then that will have increased benefits down the road too for um, healthcare costs with reduced pollution, air pollution, um, and then uh, you know tying in the, the living aspect of it and bringing in um, trees and having better stormwater management, habitat for the birds, uh, carbon sinks with, with uh, more vegetation, shade, etc. Um, to try to create better space, and then um, a more inviting place for people to gather. Uh, a couple of these pictures here are from complete streets in Minneapolis where they shut down entire avenues for several blocks and people just take over and you know, you know people doing yoga here, um, buying stuff, walking, biking, skateboarding, rollerblading, um, they have like the skateboard ramp set up, just all sorts of fun activities that, that people can do and come together and create community. Um, so those are kind of the big umbrella picture of what best practice 11 um, is trying to get at. And so I think that uh, we'll get into more detail. And uh, I want to introduce Emily Gellner. She works at the city of Golden Valley, but she is here representing um, the urban land industry. So I'll let her say a little bit about that. Good morning. Yes. All right. Can you all see me in there? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> So uh, like like Abby said, I, I volunteer for U Alive and volunteering with them for about five years. I've been working for Golden Valley for a couple years, and before that, I was working for the Home Energy Squad with Excel Energy and the Conservation Corps in Minnesota. And in my master's program at the U, I worked on this type of project, and it is a fascinating topic. So I wanted to just share some information with you guys today. So this is some images that you'll probably have seen in your communities. Sidewalks end abruptly in some areas. You see signs that say no way to sidewalks. You see people walking in the road. There is a path to get sidewalks put into your community, but it can be very, very challenging. It all really does start with leadership from your elected officials and from your department heads and your staff and from your community members. Then you move into some planning, and then you look at costs and financing. You get to design and construction, and throughout the whole process, you need to be focused on communication efforts, and then finally, maintenance is always an issue as well. So look around your community. Are you seeing goat paths or cow paths around? <laughs> Are people treading through your community trying to find a way to stay off of the road? If you see these, this is a good red flag that this is a good street for reconstruction and for sidewalks. Um, have there been accidents involving pedestrians? Is there too much impervious surface? Is that a belief by many of your staff and by your elected? And are people just walking in busy streets? And have you found that there's some kind of urgent need in some areas of your city, but maybe not in others? 
I would recommend focusing on those areas where there's urgent need because you'll have you'll have the ability to build up the most support for those areas. Try to assess how much political will you have right now and how much you might have in the future as your council members change. And understand where your low-hanging fruit would be, which is kind of tied to the sense of urgency that you may have on some of your streets. You probably want to focus more on those busy roads where people are in the most unsafe conditions or you're seeing so much impervious surface that uh, living streets could be a great candidate in that area. And um, once you've found that leadership, then you can move into the planning process. But I would recommend if you have one street in mind, don't just stop there. Think large, larger than just one street, even if you know you've got this one that could work really well. Think about what other streets in your community would work well for this type of work. And a lot of cities are doing a bicycle and pedestrian plan where they're addressing some cities are doing living streets in combination with these, and some cities are kind of keeping those two concepts separate. So bike size plans on average, that one in the middle I think was probably about $25,000, $30,000 for that consultant to complete. Not every city is going to have the kind of money to have a consultant hired to do bike and pedestrian planning. So a lot of cities are rolling their bike and ped plans into their comprehensive plan, which is just about to get underway. That's what the city of Golden Valley is doing. We ended up um, creating a task force. It includes members from each of our commissions and then just tried to get a different community members that represent different types of walking and biking. And Living Streets isn't necessarily a part of our plan yet, but I think that in time we'll combine concepts of stormwater management in with sidewalks and with bike lanes and, and complete streets. The benefit of using a comprehensive plan is that if you feel like you don't have a lot of support in your community right now, you can use this 30-year time frame to just start slowly building support instead of you know, kind of abruptly bringing about a project that may cause a lot of controversy. You can point to just over, you know, overall decades-long demographic changes and changing preferences for walking and biking and rely on that long-term to get you through kind of that initial building of support. So a lot of cities that are doing bike and ped plans are using an interactive mapping tool. It's Wikimap. It costs about $300 and you can have it for up to a year. And it allows people to, who are like savvy with interactive mapping to leave comments about what they like and don't like about walking in their community or biking in their community. Um, maybe you could incorporate Living Streets concepts into this kind of mapping tool as well because it's not really just for bike ped. It could be really about anything where you have a geographic component to the feedback that you're looking for. So this is a pretty successful tool for us. And um, I would definitely recommend it. It was wiki mapping and there's other ones as well. So um, then once you've started your bike and ped plan, you're probably trying to identify which routes would be best and which destinations people are trying to get to. These are the types of maps that you'll see in those bike ped plans, and I encourage you to just take a look through a sampling of those throughout the state. Um, they'll give you a good idea of the kind of scope of work and kind of, they're all kind of generally the same. You start with your listing your existing conditions and work through what could be better, get input from the community, and then try to prioritize which routes really work best. So some of the things to consider when you're choosing routes is which of your streets have the highest traffic volume and speeds and, and maybe not any real walking, biking facilities and no stormwater management techniques really. Um, focus on those. Proximity to destinations, are there accidents occurring you know, with pedestrians and bikers? Who owns the roadway? Who operates the roadway? They're obviously, they're your biggest stakeholder. Oftentimes, our biggest roads and our most challenging roads are the ones that are run by the state and the county. So we have to work with those agencies to find solutions. Then again, constantly assessing your political will. And then um, street reconstruction schedule is really important because you're likely not going to be putting in a sidewalk unless the whole street is being reconstructed. And with, once you find out that schedule, you can start to work with that. The proximity of transit stops is, of course, important. And then the big one is the um, right-of-way width. And this is something that I've become more familiar with, but I'm still working with our engineers to totally understand all of the components that go into that. But often our residents aren't so aware of the, the fact that you need certain amounts of right-of-way width to really do the project that they want. So oftentimes the planner is trying to help communicate that back to the community, what the engineer has told you so abruptly, abruptly in a meeting and then you need to find a way to communicate that back. And so um, another strategy that works well in a lot of communities is to identify your redevelopment areas in your city, and then if you feel that those are not walkable yet, 
you can add into your comprehensive plan or your bike pit plan that you will require sidewalks with any new redevelopment in those areas. You know, and, and that's, you don't want to, you want to be careful with this one because there's some councils who are afraid that they're going to drive development away if they require too much of their developers. So just be careful about what kind of development fees you're charging and, and what you're requiring and try to balance that with all the other needs that your city may have and decide if sidewalks are in living streets is for sure the way you want to go with that particular redevelopment area. But this is a great thing to be doing during your comprehensive plan because it's less, in, it's less intense of a discussion if you're talking citywide over 30 years than if you're talking about one redevelopment parcel and it's already at council. It's almost too late by the time you've brought it up at a council meeting. So do it in your comprehensive plan. The Redevelopment Ready Guide goes through a lot of different strategies for how to be more prepared for when developers come in and, and have proposals. So I recommend checking this out and um, seeing what you can do with this. It's a really great resource. It's been out there for a few years now. So the opposition. The common points of opposition are people saying, I'll just walk in the street, I'm fine. Or you're ripping up my landscape and my irrigation in my front yard. They don't understand that their property line is not to the curb, so they feel like you're putting that sidewalk on their property. They're worried about shoveling the snow, um, having to pay for repairs or pay for the whole thing in the first place, and that the city should just focus their budget on more important things, and this is too costly and there are other priorities. Those are the common points of opposition that I feel like we can all find good ways to, to converse with people about. But then there's the crazy stuff that people say that has a lot of underlying concerns that are more based on just fear of change and just not excited about the project. They just don't like it. So then they find reasons like people appear into my home, sidewalks will actually lead criminals to my house, no one will use them. And then things like, I will literally kill you if you build this. We have, I mean, there's stories in, in lots of cities where city engineers have had their life threatened over sidewalks. And uh, we, we had one in Golden Valley on a, a pretty low volume residential street, but it would have connected a school to an important pedestrian bridge over Highway 100. And the project was killed after, I mean, there were like death threats going around. And eventually the council just said, you know, this is just not worth it at this point in time. Let's just revisit this when we've done a little more planning. And, um, you know, one way you can build support, and this is not something everyone can do, but I wanted to share it with you anyway. North St. Paul does have a great living streets plan. It was completed by Bar Engineering a few years ago. And it's a very well done plan, but the implementation is challenging with um, changing council members, changing staff, and just there needed to be more communication once the plan was completed. And there, the, the, nothing was getting done, basically. So North St. Paul is part of the Resilient Communities Project with the University of Minnesota, where they had about 40 different um, classes work on projects for North St. Paul. And I was part of one where we went out door to door and asked people in a particular neighborhood if they to rate images on an iPad at their front door. And it, it was like streets in Maplewood, like a, a, a city next door. And it had images of just kind of normal streets as they are today without really any new um, techniques, but then it had living streets techniques in those images. And then I talked to people about why they rated things certain ways. And we found that people are generally supportive of a lot of living streets designs. They just weren't even really sure it was called that. They just didn't know much about it. So once council had that kind of information, which was recent and it was, uh, you know, very positive, that was helpful for them to move forward. So that is just one way that you can you can gather feedback from people. Now the cost can get pretty intense. Uh, I pointed out the um, Connect the Park and St. Louis Park. They have a really robust program for sidewalks and trails and, and complete streets and living streets. And um, I show the cost estimate over 10 years. It's about 3.5 million for sidewalks, 12.7 million for um, all the other things that they're working on, bike lanes and trails. But then there's this disclaimer at the bottom, which you should all be aware of, is that over time, due to inflation, engineering contingencies, right of way, all these unknown project costs, the, whatever you put in your budget is likely to inflate several times over. So just being aware of that cost, I'm sure your finance director and your city engineer will tell you that pretty quickly, but if they don't, just be respectful and aware that a lot of the improvements that you might think sound like, oh, we could just throw it in the budget, it, it is expensive. And that's why pooling it with reconstruction projects that are already happening is, is very crucial. So when you're communicating the ways that you can actually save money by implementing sidewalks and living streets, 
you should give real world examples. Richfield has done a lot of good work where they took a reconstruction project on 76th Street. They've done a great job. I recommend it down someone to check out that project. But they are um, they were very clear with people about how they were saving a specific dollar amount by reconstructing uh, their street and doing like a road diet, reducing from four down to three lanes and doing a lot of other great stuff. There's a resource here called um, Complete Streets, the guide to answering the cost questions. I really like this guide. It's from Smart Girls America. It's not a very long um, guide. It's probably 10 pages or something. And it, it just helps you kind of understand what, when people are asking questions like, well, how much will this cost? And how much extra is it to do living streets versus just a normal project? You can start to kind of get at the underlying questions and come up with really good ways to communicate with people. So I definitely recommend this resource. But there's also lots of other resources. Once you start looking into it, there's, there's quite a bit of information out there. So then there's what you got to pay for it somehow. And a lot of cities are doing general obligation bonds. That's what um, St. Louis Park does. Some will do levies and special assessments, but those are not very popular. You want to try to find a way to make people feel like it's essentially free, even though it's not. But you know that's that's kind of what you want to do. Special assessments, I would just really recommend not going that route if you can help it. Municipal state aid, all cities are getting that for certain roads. However, there are state aid standards that can make um, adding sidewalks and bike lanes quite difficult. But franchise fees and utility fees are used in a lot of communities as well. You know, Edina is doing that in particular. I have a uh, photo here of Edina's fund. This is from their website, the Pedestrian and Cyclist Safety Fund. So they have um, specific bills in their franchise utility fees that go directly to bike pet improvements. So they have enough political will that they can they can funnel money into a specific type of fund that's not going to be the solution for everyone. But um, grants is another great resource, but it's just not as consistent. So if you're looking for a 10-year plan of implementation, and you, you're so aggressive, grants are not going to be the right tool for you. But if you have some maybe safe routes to school or some particular urgent needs, but you don't have a lot of political will for the entire city, then grants could be a good resource for you. Tax increment financing is a good resource in your redevelopment areas, but um, you might be you might be trying to do a lot of other improvements like sewer water type of stuff as well. So there might be some competing interests there. And trail and sidewalk dedication is, is just another resource that's used by um, St. Louis Park and some other cities. And it's a good option, but it, again, it's something to keep in mind is what is your whole like big picture of what you're charging developers to redevelop in your community? You want to try to balance all those fees and not, not way overdo it, or you might drive redevelopment away from your community. <coughs> then there's all the design considerations, and this is where you can get into a lot of discussion um, where there's all these different things to keep in mind. The right of way width is the biggest one that's immediate, but then there's how much space do you need to plant trees that will actually stay alive? And are there fences and retaining walls in the right of way that shouldn't have been there in the first place? Um, and are the, where are the utilities located? So the design process can get pretty expensive, but it is important. And a lot of engineers are looking for consistency in their facilities throughout their city. So that will be a factor in the design process. The stated manual I had referenced um, briefly, but there are um, lane widths required for trucks on stated roads, so like 12-foot lanes, which makes it challenging when you're trying to fit in bike lanes and sidewalks, and so trying to make that balance is important. But the stated manual is associated with funding, so that's why uh, we have to follow the standards. There is a variance process to that, but um, I don't, it's kind of complicated. Um, I just listed some of the other um, things to keep in mind about minimum widths and right-of-way challenges. So most cities are using their pavement management programs to implement living streets or complete streets. And they break up the city into different districts and then they repave those streets or reconstruct those streets every so often, every few years or well, tens of years. And um, the pavement management in Golden Valley was just an example of they do that about that many streets, that many blocks in a given year. And it's pretty expensive, but Golden Valley's found a way to um, to budget that into their capital improvement program and to communicate it really well so that it's generally well supported throughout the community. And the construction process can be pretty rough on people. So this is where communication becomes the most important, I'd say. I mean, communication is important the whole way through, but construction is where you really want to be ahead of the game. You want to make sure people are well aware of the project before it's actually happening. So um, 
a lot of cities are doing like construction news where it's a mailing sent to their house every so often or email updates or the Salem's Park has public meetings um, before each of these project projects go into place. And we have before and after photos of other streets that have just been redone, and that is pretty helpful. Once people see those, they, they can get a little more excited about what's coming to them. And then I recommend checking out Richfield Sweet Streets. I think it's sweetstreets.org. It's a full website that talks about um, roundabouts as well. So other controversial kind of topics that people want to get involved in and want to know more about. So I think uh, you know using your online resources is helpful, but then um, making sure your your council is all on board and understands um, what's about to happen. I can't emphasize communication and leadership enough with this particular type of um, project. I think in the scheme of like all the Green Step Cities uh, initiatives and, and steps, that this sidewalks one is the one where you really need community and elected leadership to push through. There's other ones where the city staff can be the leader and it will work well for the technical expert to bring that through, but this is not one of those. I think this is has to be community driven because it's just so controversial. Um, lastly is just maintenance. Keep in mind that the infrastructure costs, I have this as a funny photo. I, I don't think I've ever seen this in real life, but that's funny. And um, a lot of cities will use GIS to kind of keep track of how their sidewalks are doing. Are they are they up to up to speed? Winter maintenance is the last thing. Some cities have adopted like a volunteer program where you can shovel sidewalks for your neighbors and make it kind of a formal thing. So I think that there's probably some potential in every community for that type of thing. So I would encourage you to look into that. One fun note that um, Golden Valley, I don't know how many other cities do this, but Golden Valley shovels everyone's sidewalks. Everybody's sidewalks. So the idea of putting in more sidewalks at this point is a big challenge for us. And it, it really worries our public works staff. Like, can we really handle taking this on? So, it, you know, that's just something that we are probably going to have to assess as we build more sidewalks in the future. Um, this is some before and after photos of this would be St. Louis Park. And the two top images, you can see how it looked before and then, and then after. It's not too drastic, really. So using before and after photos can be a great way to communicate the changes that you'd like to make. And that's all I have for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> I can take questions now or later or okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole the whole state aid variance question, I find in the last two years there has the, the process for seeking a variance when you receive state aid funds has been made simpler or there were some sort of preset criteria for being able to waive uh, street width considerations, but I, that's not all I know. Can you? That's, that's my understanding as well, that variances are easier to obtain. I don't have the short list of what those items are, how you'd get that variance. Do you know, Hannah? Um, I mean, I mostly just encourage people to bother to seek it out. It is yeah. easier than it used to be, um, and I think some people sort of view the state aid standards as, you know, handed down from a mountain carved in stone, and that's not necessarily the case. One of the things, too, especially with respect to working for the state or a particular county or something like that, is the individual that you're working with. If there's someone that's accustomed to the more um, strict and time-consuming method, um, it might be a little bit harder to bring them along. There are a lot of different people that work at a lot of different agencies, and so sometimes you just have to find the right sort of internal advocate to help you. Okay. Uh, you cautioned against using special assessments to help pay for sidewalks. Um, I'd second that. Uh, <laughs> uh, you been through it? Oh yeah. People don't want it. People don't think it's going to be used. People don't want to take care of it. And then you're asking them to pay a thousand dollars for it. I mean that really. Way to kill your project quiet. quickly. Yeah. Uh, and I think. Edina uses franchise fees yes. to dedicate towards infrastructure or sidewalks. Or, and I'm wondering if there's other examples if, if you if you think that's a good way to go. I think that's an excellent way to go with franchise and utility fees. Edina has theirs put into a particular fund. I'm not sure that every city is using calling it a bike and pedestrian fund though. I think Edina's been really clear about that because they're 
they have so much political will over several councils to have such a strong plan that they can be very vocal about having that dedicated fund. Some other cities maybe want to take a more quiet approach to it to not bring so much energy to the to the topic exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good South River also um, just started their franchise last year and um, I think they did a really good job of communicating what it is to the public and a lot of um, really good feedback from it and honestly well, once in a while people call and they want to bring some of my info to do it but once they understand what it really is and they're not getting those addresses anymore it seems to really um, pull the people. Yeah. Infrastructure. I know that City of New Brighton, it's not for living streets necessarily, but they have a beautification program. So they have an option where you can round up your bill to the nearest dollar, and that money goes towards a certain cause. What is the, you know what their participation is for that? I haven't checked in. No, that'd be good to find out from New Brighton. Round up on what? Um, I think it's their utility bill. <coughs> round up. Yep. So yep. what's the new Christmas? What's the explanation to citizens? So I'm getting a... I'm getting a bill for my, let's say, water, gas, whatever combination is mixed up. And then there's a line for, how is it explained? Or do people feel like the private utility is like, how is it? I'm just curious. Yeah, uh, I think that where that communication part at the beginning really comes into play because all of those really need to be subject to be given up. You can't read that and really understand what it's for. Right. from the webinar. Um, could you explain what the wiki tool was a little bit more? Sure. So it's called wiki mapping and it's just like an interactive mapping tool so it'll use like Google Maps in the background and then people can log in and you, you can remain anonymous if you want. You don't have to have a login necessarily. But you'll um, use the mapping tool to perhaps say where you feel like you don't feel very safe trying to walk or bike or you you like using this particular route or you'd like to see a different facility there or you'd like to point out that maintenance is not occurring at the level that you'd like to see. So it's a good way of getting feedback from people in a geographic sense and it's not for everyone but it can help you understand where in the city there are particular issues and that um, wiki mapping option is $300 for a year's worth of the service. There's also interesting, sorry, you have a question. Uh, there's interesting tools, you know, that bikers and runners uh, use that are apps, you know, Map My Ride or Map My Run or Strava or whatever, that, you know, if you log in and you take a look at it, it will show you, you know, these heat maps of where people are using um, routes in your city. And so you can kind of look at what popular bike routes are um, within your city limits as well. And, and cool sort of is, is that same sort of... Um, what did you call it, a ghost trail? Yeah. Through yeah. <laughs> your city. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's, yeah, lots of kind of cool technology pieces out there that can be used for different purposes than they were intended for. Yeah. Okay. Um, Fridley's got a safe route to school grant right now, so we're using that wiki mapping tool. And even if you don't, it's really great for leading into comp planning because you can put hazards down or, you know, work with the school system and say this is a neighborhood that's being bus but actually is within the walk shed. Okay. And so yeah. you know, if these barriers were removed or this gap in sidewalks, you know, were these gaps were corrected, you know, more kids could be safely walking. Okay. Um, that was just a spin off of what you were talking about, but um, Fridley has every sidewalk we build and we're in our own shoveling and I wanted to know if anybody has bought that to try to get back to more like Minneapolis and some of the larger communities are doing where it's personal property owner responsibility to remove the snow down the dry pavement. Well, I don't know anyone that's tried to get away from that yet in our area, but I would say that if we decide to tackle that, it's going to have to be over the course of several years, and it'll probably have to be like a phase thing where we do parts of the city start to take over. 
or we ask our able-bodied residents to maybe start the process of shoveling their own snow and work from there. But I don't know what council is going to want to fall on that sword. I, it's probably going to have to happen when there's not anyone up for their next term. Honestly, it's going to be one of those one of those things. <laughs> How many cities shovel sidewalks for their rents? Everybody there? I personally like shoveling, so I would be really annoyed if we decided to shovel the sidewalks. You're sort of wondering, in, in, again, with the comp plan and thinking about um, healthy initiatives and things like exercise, and that's sort of, I mean, I live in St. Paul, granted, mm -hmm. my property was only 40 feet. But the house next door is vacant, the house next door on the other side has an elderly woman, so I do a lot. But it's just sort of, it's, you know, gets me, I don't know, I just sort of thinking about that in terms of if that's a strategy. For yeah, people. that's and a good I mean, point. I think I give, mm -hmm. your point is right on, though. It's it's a tough, tough yeah. road. The comp plan would be a great place to mention it. Well, yeah, start. Say eventually, we won't be able to sustain this service. sustainability. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. I really like um, the volunteer. Um, shoveling program that is sort of for that for that same reason. There just are private property owners that either just aren't going to shovel or aren't able to shovel. Can't, yeah. And so, like hearing that Golden Valley shovels for their like that's something that we've like nationally people have been asking us like how do we have better maintained sidewalks? Our our private property owners aren't interested. It's like well the city can do it. Well that costs money, you know. Um, and I think that, that that volunteer program might be a good kind of stopgap for that for folks that are physically able and are. Enjoy, I enjoy shoveling too, you know. So like I would do too. Or maybe the lots. city should facilitate that program. Exactly. Yeah. If they're phasing well, out. Yeah, it's, it's more than health. Program. I mean, in terms of like even building community. I mean, one of the reasons why we have a boulevard garden is that it's part of our community. That it's in the right of way. You know, we're definitely poaching. You know, but you know, just sort of building that community. So if you're out there, it's exercise and it's community connectivity and social. I, I mean, there's lots of benefits. Again, it's it's a. You're right. It's a, probably a decade-long effort, you know, if not more. The approach that I'm going to take is we have an active transportation plan, and then we're com combining that that was to essential job nodes and commercial nodes, and we're going to combine that with a safe route to school route, and plow those and then try to roll other sidewalks onto personal responsibility, yeah. but not another volunteer group to run, because that could start to lead to code enforcement issues. The biggest problem is public works misalignment with the right kind of equipment to get down to dry pavement, which yields ice, which we don't fault. And so then you have liability issues, too. So it's, it's a hairball for sure. Well, I'll stop there. I'll probably hand it over I'm to Hannah. Oh, OK. Oh. Yeah. Um, I know that Southern Heights has recently gone yeah. through the adding sidewalks. I'm wondering if you want to share your story of what some of the um, <coughs> pros and cons or the barriers or ways that you found over the barriers were lessons learned, I guess. Uh, so I'm glad you did put me on the hot spot because we actually did not add a sidewalk. Uh, uh, not a super busy street, um, kind of moderate. Uh, but it was a route to our one and only elementary school. And uh, lots of parents walking their kids along this street. Uh, this is about a year or so ago. And uh, yeah, it was, it was very controversial, particularly for residents on that route. And um, we applied for safe routes to school, didn't get it. And so we ultimately, uh, kicked the can down the road a little bit and did not reconstruct that street uh, in order for us to reapply for safe routes to school uh, in the next year or two. We changed from uh, taking care of sidewalks on one street, Carpenter Avenue, and made it the responsibility of the property owner. Uh, Larpenter Avenue, lots of businesses, the University of Minnesota, St. Paul campus is on Larpenter Avenue, and we were wondering why are we investing our staff time to take care of this huge chunk of University of Minnesota <laughs> property um, and uh, lots of rental houses, things like that. And boy, that was really controversial. A surprise, surprise, they didn't like to take care of it. Uh, so we're this is our second winter, and we're 
sticking to our guns about that one. Uh, I mean, the irony about this is that one could say this is a <clears throat> less government lower taxes. I mean, this is right. Like <laughs> bedrock. The public has personal responsibility. You know, personal responsibility. But probably you'd be shot if you could throw that in the face. But I mean, it really is. It's a very. Uh, you know, no, it's a tentative conservative. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. I was on the flip side of the political spectrum. I had a socialist on my block. Yes, he had a shovel in the block. No. No. Politically, I had a shovel in the block. Yeah, on the flip side of that, they'll say this is right away. This is publicly owned land. Okay. And I pay taxes. Um, unless you're the University of Minnesota. Or <laughs> 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 I mean, they don't want that. But if you're a private business, you right. pay property taxes. This is what I'm paying property taxes for. Somehow, you know, when West, North St. Paul, when North St. Paul, when their plan crashed and burned, I thought the one thing they didn't try was to talk to you know, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and, um, you know, all of their fraternal organizations and, and, and maybe have a phase-in plan over a couple of years where you, you had community members and groups out there I don't think that ever got considered. That's an, probably coming with a really positive, yeah, this is exercise of things that neighbor trouble. This is part of our lean, mean government. I <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts with that because um, I found calling Boy Scouts true people, they, they're, the leaders are changing, the kids are changing. Same thing with the builders clubs and the key clubs and the high schools yeah, and middle schools on. and things. And so you're, you just get one group trained in and then yeah. it's a different Changer. set and staff time and all. Right. I mean, there's, you know, there's a balancing act there that might be challenging. Well, that was really yeah. great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to go a little bit off of what Patrick said and uh, the community building aspect of shoveling. Uh, a few years ago when we got like 18 inches of snow or whatever in that one day, um, and we spent all day shoveling and like shoveling our neighbor's cars out and trying to move everybody, and it's just like a good, fun time that you're not really paying attention to how much energy you're spending. And then we walked down to, I was in Longville at the time, we walked down to Merlin's Rest, which is a great, you know, like, pub feel, and everybody's in there having just shoveled, and, you know, we see our friends who are in there, like, hey, you know, and sharing our shoveling stories, and so that, to me, stands out as one of my, my favorite days and my favorite times of um, bringing people together is when we get really good Minnesota snowball and can all enjoy it together. Um, so we're going to shift gears and go into the traffic homing, so Hannah Pritchard is with okay. School Design Group. Um, so while we're talking about shoveling snow, I guess, uh, my husband and I just bought our house in North Minneapolis last October. So last winter was my first opportunity as a transportation person to be responsible for a piece of sidewalk. And I was so excited. I didn't do the driveway at the back. My husband did that. I didn't care about the driveway. Um, but then it was my, uh, the house next to me on the corner is a rental. And they didn't shovel very regularly. And so I felt like I owed it to the kids that were waiting at the bus stop to shovel their property. But then at the same time, I know that this guy owns this house for profit. And I know that he's hired a landscaper whose job it is to do it. And so I didn't do it because I wasn't going to give him that service for free. And it's just a really interesting kind of psychology of like, I wanted the kids to be able to get to the bus stop, but then at the same time, I didn't want to give the landlord free services. So it's, it's really challenging. Did you call a city and complain then? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I make a lot of three one one calls. <laughs> uh, so okay, um, so so this is me. Um, I am a professional engineer. I have two civil engineering degrees and a professional <coughs> license. I'm also a PTOE, which is a um, professional traffic operations engineer, which is the traffic engineering certification. Just in case I needed more letters. Um, I work for Tool Design Group. We are a bicycle and pedestrian planning and design firm. We work all over the country. Our Minneapolis office has about eight folks. We've got about 100 people in the company. Um, so I have a lot of 
uh, really good national resources with respect to some of the stuff that we're working on here. Oh, uh, just quick background about me. Uh, this is my Midwestern ramble. Uh, I was born in Rochester, Minnesota. I went to high school in Indianapolis, Indiana. Both of my degrees are from Michigan State University. I lived in Lansing for six years. Um, and then I moved to Detroit, Michigan. I lived, in this, lived and worked in the city of Detroit for seven years. Um, it was a really valuable experience. I'm glad I did it. I'm also glad to live in a place with streetlights. So in 2014, my husband and I moved back to Minnesota. We moved to Minneapolis, actually, so I could take the job with Tool Design Group. My family is still down in Rochester, which is a little bit closer to home. Um, and there's no here to shovel. Um, so I have a lot of things that I want to talk about. Um, and I wanted to kind of get from you guys what you'd like to hear. Um, so I have five topics, and then we'll do a little Mentimeter, and I'll have you pick two, and then I'll talk about three. Um, so I'm just going to kind of talk through the topics, see what, um, what you might be interested in. Uh, the first topic I have is sort of the history of traffic engineering. I think for a lot of folks, our uh, public infrastructure just exists, and it's always been there, and that's not the case. I-94 wasn't always there. Um, and so just kind of some history of how we ended up kind of in the culture that we're in now. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> So the second one, if I can think the second one is travel demand forecasting. Um, and so one of the things um, that I think if you talk to traffic engineers a lot, um, you're working on a project or a new development, and say, well, we want to know about the traffic in 2040. We don't care about the traffic in 2016. We want to know about 2040. And so um, I have just a little bit of information about kind of how that happens, how we get those numbers, and sort of what that can mean with respect to the projects that we do. Um, the third item is traffic engineering assumptions um, and just sort of some of the technical jargon that we use. The, um, there we go. How did I do? I did pretty good. Okay. Uh, so level of service, uh, peak hour, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, again, traffic engineers kind of like to talk in our jargon and occasionally we might use it to defend ourselves against people that don't want to do what we want to do. Um, so we can talk through some of that stuff. Uh, I was asked here about traffic calming, so I do have a traffic calming toolbox. These are really specific things that you can do in your communities to help try to kind of bring traffic speeds down and, and make some of those livable things that we were talking about. And then the last one is the case for traffic calming and alternative modes. So if you need a little bit of uh, information to try to kind of help push a city council member um, towards doing some of this stuff, I have just some uh, sort of pro street uh, propaganda, I guess, uh, <laughs> that, I can, that I can share with you. So I think we're going to go to the Mentimeter. Um, I don't know if you guys have done this before, but if you pull out your cell phones, we'll have, um, uh, you can go to menti.com, right, M-E-N-T-I, and then use this code up at the top here, 839674, um, and it will give you a choice of what to vote on, and you can vote for um, what you want to hear about, we'll just give that a minute. It seemed like a good idea on Monday when I couldn't decide what to talk about, but then last night I had to actually prepare all three items, <laughs> or all five items. Um, so it was it was a good exercise. Okay. and I also host an annual chili cook-off every year. And so I was, I was playing with this um, last night. Oh, should we use that for the chili cook-off? And I was like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. okay, cool. So we have a little bit of two-way communication with the webinar, then. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah. All right, well, um, these topics still make sense in order. And I think we've got a pretty clear set of three. Um, so, well, maybe. <laughs> um, all right. Well, it's, uh, if we have more time, we can always come back into the other two as well. 
Yeah, so we'll start with the travel room and forecasting, um, which is slide 13. Whoa. Okay. All right, here's topic one really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, one of my coworkers is a cartoonist, um, Ian Lockwood. He's uh, in our Orlando office. He's the only one in our Orlando office. Um, but I'll just I'll read this. <laughs> <laughs> um, our drive traffic demand model forecasts pedestrian traffic to grow by 1.25% for approximately the next 350,000 years. So what's your modal split assumption? Mostly 1.0. Nobody expects the development of an alternative mode of transportation until the 349,800 year horizon. <laughs> so just sort of a commentary on the fact that human beings walked around pretty universally. So we're talking about the challenge of putting in sidewalks, where that was our primary mode of transportation for a long time. Um, so one of the things that um, we talk about quite a bit in traffic engineering is this concept of vehicle miles traveled, we call it VMT. Uh, this here is a chart of the total VMT for the entire United States. So the um, values on the left there are in the trillions of vehicle miles. Um, as you can see, we had a pretty continuous increase um, from the 70s up to the early 2000s, and then we kind of leveled off for a lot of reasons. Um, folks want to blame the economy. There were, you can kind of see um, some shocks and recessions. Yeah, some recession-related shocks, but this, this shock is longer um, than any of the ones that we've seen before. Uh, one of the things that, as traffic engineers, if we don't have any information about the growth in a community, but we know we want to look at future traffic, um, we'll just say, well, it'll increase by 2% per year. We'll just assume there'll be 2% more traffic next year and then 2% on top of that the following year. Um, and the slope of that line from 1980 to 2000 is about 2%. Um, but you can see that it changed quite a bit. Um, and I wish I had a, a, a better copy of this graphic. This was put together by the Frontier Group. Um, what we have here, the black line is um, that chart that I just showed you through about 2014. And then the blue lines are um, the Federal Highway Administration's projection of what we think traffic is going to be like in the future. So in the early 90s, we thought, oh, well, by 2015, there's going to be you know, billions more miles driven. Um, and then as things started to level off, uh, they sort of they're like, well, maybe we'll step it back a little bit. <laughs> um, and so the slope of this red line is actually 0.75% per year. Wow. Um, and so for folks that really want to like have um, you know, a, a, a source for, for saying, okay, we can assume less traffic is going to show up than we previously assumed, that's from FHWA. That's, that's still not even close to probably what the, uh, what the drawdown really was, but it's, it's an acknowledgment that that's happening. Um, so, just to break it down, per capita, I really like to look at this per person. This seems like an obvious statement, but there are more people in the United States every year, uh, more people eligible to drive. So, the increase in BMT is not necessarily individuals driving more, it's more people being available to drive. Um, and actually, if you look at the per person, um, the United States took this really big dip, um, 10,000 miles per year. I think if you talk to your car insurance company, that's like what they're going to assume. If they ask you how much you drive, and that's like the assumption if you don't tell them. Uh, so um, then the red line is Minnesota, and this is actually something really interesting. I went to look up the, the 2015 data. Um, I had a really good narrative at the APA conference two years ago where I was like, no one is ever going to drive anymore. Uh, but then the, it kind of ticked up again, so I have to, <laughs> I have to figure that narrative out again now. Um, no, but what's interesting here is this green dot. Um, MnDOT, I guess, is having some kind of issue with their reporting, they're changing their system, whatever. So for 2015, I'm like, well, we can't actually tell you, but just assume a 3% increase over 2014. So here's, here's your total. We just assume 3% increase. And so you can see kind of like, okay, we're just going to keep assuming that the traffic's just going to keep going up forever. Um, so, so travel demand forecasting. So um, this is, Met Council has a big 
complicated piece of software that everybody puts their comp plans in and then they kick out information about how much traffic you're going to have on your streets. One of the things um, with respect to that software, a lot of times folks really use it as a black box. They say, oh, well, the model told us. The model said, you know, the model doesn't have volition. The model isn't making these decisions for you. It's just a piece of data. And one of the things that I think um, is pretty cr critical to remember, especially when you're talking about bike and pedestrian planning, um, is the size of the units in the model. So these blue lines are what they call the traffic analysis zones. And you can see some of, the, you know, there, there are many, many blocks. So if you're trying to decide, for example, whether or not to install a sidewalk on one block, that is something that's not even going to show up at the scale of the regional model. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I get asked about a lot in my job is, well, we do all this forecasting for vehicle traffic. Can we forecast bike traffic? Can we forecast pedestrian traffic? And it's like, well, the entire pedestrian trip is going to happen within one of those areas. And so it's like the scale is just not right. It's too big. Um, and so with, with respect to forecasting, um, this is a quote from Project for Public Spaces that I really like. If you plan cities for car and traffic, you get cars and traffic. Um, so when you're looking at um, you know, these assumptions that people are going to continue to drive and people are going to drive more and the new people that move to your city are also going to drive and then you build a community so they can drive in it, they'll probably drive. You know, so, okay, so that one is that. Um, I think we're doing the toolbox. Yeah? So it's like 34. One of the other things, um, I was having a, a conversation actually with a coworker who was giving a presentation at the U um, last week, uh, and we were talking about planning and decision making. Um, and deciding not to decide is still a decision, um, <laughs> which is what, kind of one of the things that kind of came out of the conversation that um, I thought would be, uh, I don't know what made me think to say that just now, but that, that's been sticking with me all week. Um, okay, so here's the toolbox. So these are like really specific things um, that we like to recommend in our bike and pedestrian plans when working with cities around the country. Uh, stuff that you can try to maybe implement. A uh, really good way to sort of retrofit your existing system. Uh, trees. <laughs> uh, medians, curb extensions, the number of lanes, lane width, curb reaction and shy distance, parking, site design, furniture, and art. I've got, here, here we go. Um, everybody here pretty much understood the value of tree-lined streets. One of the things, in addition to um, looking nice and feeling nice, um, in order to reduce travel speeds, one of the things that we, we like to try to do is make the roadway feel more narrow. And so any vertical element on the side helps to kind of contribute to that narrow feeling. So buildings that are up against, um, right up against the edge of the right-of-way, uh, you know, more than one story, uh, trees can do that as well. And if you get trees in the median and in the outside, um, it just feels like you can't quite go as quickly. Um, as we sort of develop the transportation system that we have now, one of the problems that we ran into very early on was that people would drive off the road and run into trees. And that was dangerous and sometimes it killed them. And so as transportation engineers, you know what our response was. Get rid of the trees. <laughs> yes. Nothing higher than eight inches in the median. <laughs> I quote a county. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Remove the trees. Clearly, if people are running into trees, which have been there longer than the people have been there, um, with their cars, the solution is to remove the tree. So we get this concept of a clear zone, uh, which is something that we use on the freeway system. Uh, and so when you're out on the freeway in a you know kind of a rural segment, you feel like you can go 80 miles an hour. So if you get that same feeling in your city, you're going to end up speeding up. So trees are one really valuable resource um, with respect to traffic coming. Uh, the next one here is medians. Um, I, this one is uh, West End in St. Louis Park. I really like um, the, the design there. Uh, definitely can be landscaped, but the one down in the bottom here, which I think is from Seattle maybe, they don't have to be. 
know, having having something in the media, the mo the more, the bigger, the better with respect to traffic calming, but they don't have to be. Um, if you can get uh, just a little bit um, of space in the middle too, that'll help for uh, pedestrian refuge with respect to a crossing location. Curve extensions. This one's one of my favorites. Um, this one on the left from Seattle, we've got a lot of stormwater retention in that in that space. So if you've got um, uh, if you've got some on-street parking, then when you get to the intersections, you maybe eliminate a parking space or two and extend the sidewalk area into that parking space. Um, so the one on, on uh, the left there has a lot of other value. It's aesthetic. It's got some trees, stormwater, yada yada. Uh, the one on the right in Alexandria still works. Not so pretty. It's not so pretty. But one of the things that I want to kind of emphasize here is that you know we have ranges of budgets available, and you don't have to have the brick pavers and the and the bioswale in order to still have some of these impacts. Um, I don't think it's this one. I think it's another one. But we have a really good picture of like a really big one where it just was a curved intersection. It was weird. And it's a safe route to school route. And so it's really ugly. But it's not ugly when you see all the little kids walking to school in it, you know? And so it's, it's really just what, what can you do? I want you guys to have some stuff that you can do tomorrow, you know, with respect to um, doing some traffic calming. Uh, the one on the right is technically, I mean, the, the signs are there, but you can also do them temporarily. Just get some construction cones out there, see what happens. Um, now that it's snowing, there's a Twitter hashtag, uh, down, as in neck down with an S for snow. Have <laughs> you guys heard of this? Yeah. <laughs> um, and so folks will post pictures of intersections in various cities where you can see where people have been driving because the snow is worn away, which means you can see where people have not been driving because there is still snow there. And so that can kind of give you a perspective of where you might have pavement that you don't need it. And so, you know, something temporary, something more permanent can go in that space. Um, so number of travel lanes, we talked a little bit about making assumptions about how much traffic is going to be in your community in the future. Um, and one of the things with respect to those forecasts is also considering if you even need to be planning for future traffic. Like I just suggested with the um, you know, kind of temporary curb extension, uh, your traditional traffic engineer might say, oh, maybe you're taking out a right turn lane in order to get some more, some more pedestrian space. Well, we should really look at you know, 2040, how that's going to work with 25% more traffic than we have today. Well, I mean, it's a temporary installation. Let's see if it works now and then maybe let traffic evolve around it and see if that's an option. So for some of your kind of more low cost stuff, like can we just look at it with today's traffic? Do we really have to go out into the future? Um, so getting a uh, number of traffic lanes, one of the things that I as a traffic engineer am a really big fan of and also I've seen a lot of eligible roadways in Minnesota more so than when I was in Michigan um, is the four lane to three lane conversion. Um, and I've got some sort of traffic calming reasons for this. Uh, one of the reasons that I like it from a traffic engineer standpoint is if you've got a four lane road and you have a lot of left turns, maybe you've got uh, business driveways or you know just short blocks, whatever, the folks that are waiting to turn left are in the left through lane, so that's not a through lane anymore. So when people have to get over, but then you had on street parking for part of the day in the right lane, and it, it's just really chaotic. Um, and so this is somebody getting over to get around the person that's trying to turn left. If I go to three lanes, the person waiting to turn left has somewhere to sit. Uh, and then the through traffic can continue through. Um, if you're in, a, if you have a, an average daily traffic volume on your roadway of less than 15,000, this could actually operate better than the four lane. It's less chaotic. Uh, drivers have less they have to pay attention to. They're more likely to see pedestrians. You're talking about capacity and ease of movement. When you say <laughs> work better, what do you mean by work better? Good point. Um, yeah, via, yeah, vehicle capacity. You can actually get, in some cases, you can actually get more throughput if you have a, a dedicated left turn lane. Yeah. 
the other thing is with uh, with the four lane situation that's right to the curbs. Um, speed limit control by police is is negligible, and because they have no safe place in the lane of traffic to pull over speeders, and so there's no violation enforcement taking Good place point. on a lot of those roads. Yeah. Whereas if you convert to the three lane, then they've got a safe place to pull over speeders, so you're reducing traffic speed in two ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, some of the other stuff that happens when you do this four to three conversion is you only you only have one lane that pedestrians have to cross. Um, so we have this concept of a um, multiple threat crash where the, the person in the right lane stops for the pedestrian and then the person behind them is like, what are you doing? And they zoom around and then they, um, so, and you can see too, here we've got curve extensions, we've got medians, we've got trees. Um, it just gives you a lot more options with respect to doing stuff for your other modes on your roadway. Splitting widths. Okay, so this one didn't quite show up too well. It showed better on my computer screen. But you can see right here where the, that yellow line used to be. Um, this is in Seattle, and they basically narrowed every lane and gave themselves space to um, add in a bike lane. So we have some research that shows that um, people tend to drive more slowly in more narrow lanes. Um, narrow lanes tend to exist in slow speed environments, and so it's just sort of one more signal to send to drivers. Um, I wouldn't recommend narrowing lane widths as the only thing to do if you still have wide open sides and, and your buildings are far away and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's not necessarily going to help. We did talk about municipal state aid already. There are um, certainly lane width requirements, but uh, one of the things that I think is important is, um, you know, your city is your community, and the traffic that is coming through your community should come through on your terms. Um, if you, like, the, the people that are there versus the people that are coming through, I shouldn't say versus, but um, the people that are there should have priority over the people that are coming through. And so as a community, if that's something that you can say, and you say, you know what, I know that these are the typical standards, but here in our town, we want to make sure that people drive more slowly, and we know that reduced language will do that, and there isn't a ton of truck traffic on this particular road, or our truck drivers are skilled enough to drive in narrow lanes. Um, you know, it, it's uh, um, definitely something worth uh, worth pursuing. The other one um, from municipal state aid, this is a, um, the, I had to pull up the MnDOT tech memo on this concept that um, engineers use that like the terms are kind of weird and you end up with all this excess space is curb reaction, um, which means that if you have a curb on the side of the roadway, municipal state aid wants you to have some space between the edge of the actual lane and that curb. Frequently, that's the gutter. Um, sometimes it's not. And so if you're looking at a cross section of 80 feet, and you're trying to cram everything in there, and you've got a four-foot sidewalk and a five-foot bike lane, and you just need an ex like that extra foot is really important. This curb reaction distance is basically for a driver in the lane to be able to correct their movement before hitting the curb. You know what happens when the car hits the curb? Almost nothing. It startles the driver. You know, I mean, if they're going like 60, they'll launch, but they shouldn't be going 60 in the first place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you're thinking about a downtown, you're thinking about a city street, you're thinking about a residential street, this, this concept of, of giving, giving drivers a chance to correct before the thing that's supposed to correct them. What is shy distance? Is that what you're describing right yeah, now? Yeah, they call, it, they call it the same thing sometimes. Um, you'll also do if you have a, sometimes if you have a barrier wall, your shy distance might be more because people can scrape the mirrors of their cars on the wall and so we want to make sure that we leave room so we don't scrape any mirrors. Um, <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, and so it's, it's, in, it's in municipal state aid and so if you're, if you're building a brand new roadway or you're kind of out in a wide open area, like sure, what's an extra foot? But sometimes you're really negotiating down to the inch to get the stuff to fit in there, and this is something that just kind of flies under the radar. Is like, oh well, we always have curb reaction, um, and so you're you're traveling. It could be 11 feet, it's 12 feet, and then it's actually 14 feet, and you're, you're taking up a lot of space. So you know, just just consider these options when you're really kind of 
trying to fight for space in the right of way. Um, on street parking, benefits of on street parking creates friction on the roadway, uh, provides a buffer for the sidewalk, and can support certain types of retail. Um, as someone who does planning for bike lanes, I end up in a lot of very contentious conversations about on street parking. Sometimes the storage of private property in the public right of way is not a priority over having a place to bike safely. That's not always the case. So there are times when on street parking can provide a benefit. Um, if you think about folks kind of cruising for parking, slowing down, um, brings the brings the travel speeds down, um, and that 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 buffer for the sidewalk can be can be nice too. Um, site design. So this is one um, that obviously is a little bit longer term since you're not just going to pick your Walgreens up and put it on the corner tomorrow. Um, but what what happens here is having the building up against the edge of the roadway provides more of that narrow feeling. Um, it's also more pedestrian friendly. If you're walking on the sidewalk, you can right, walk right through the store instead of having to tramp through a parking lot. Um, so increased visibility for pedestrians, improves the streetscape overall. Um, you can still do on-site parking in driveways. You know, you've got two driveway access points. Um, there's actually a really good example on University Avenue. Um, I think it's at Snelling, either Snelling or Raymond. There's a convenience store on the corner that was built before the light rail, and the city of St. Paul had a requirement. CVS. CVS. Northwest yeah. corner. Yeah. Snelling and University. Snelling and University. So they had a requirement that there would be a door facing the street, but CVS like didn't believe them or didn't want to do it or something, so they only had the door into the parking lot. It's a covered arcade, though, is what they built. Yeah, it's not like really a door. Right. So you know, you know a little bit more about. It's a hideous building. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 like it, but the door, the door. You're right. The door is right on the corner. You walk in that door, and you have to walk down the hallway to the main door, which faces the parking lot on the interior of the block. Yeah. So it sort of solves that. But again, having clear open windows and other design sort of pedestrian mm -hmm. things, yeah, big F. You know, it's not. It's, oh yeah, yeah. But. Um, I, I, the thing I like, the thing I like, <laughs> was that they built it the one way. They built it the one way, and then because they were required to have, they had to retrofit it, and if they just built it the right way the first time, it wouldn't be nearly as hideous. But there was this moment where you're driving on university, and this building was literally opening up a door to the street that wasn't there before. Um, the other example that I have is up on Central and Northeast. There was a, a this was a Walgreens that was kind of set back on a parcel, and it's one of those things where they build a Walgreens across from a Walgreens, and you're like, really? But the new one is is more up um, up to the sidewalk, and it really it's in that area, like 26, I think, on Central, where you have that street frontage that needs to keep moving forward, and that new Walgreens helps bring it bring it along, and so you can. See, I think the old building is still there, so you can like see them both at the same time, and like how much of a better pedestrian experience it is, but then also how much of a traffic calming, traffic calming impact it has, because that is entrance into the area where you know that you have lots of storefronts and um, pedestrians and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Just a quick question to that. Do you know of any studies that help? Because the number one thing that I've run into is retailers and brokers have uh, what I think is an old-fashioned belief that that will not work as well for the drive up customer. And of course, all these retailers think that the bulk of their business, and probably their correct, is going to come from the car. Do you know of any studies that have uh, been done to help illustrate how that's not necessarily true any longer? Um, I'm sure that there is research out there. Um, let me let me ask the tools and group hive mind. I'm sure we have it. The thing that, and I, I have some other slides that I didn't include in this, and I wish that I did. Um, there is a Home Depot in Manhattan. Okay? People go to Home Depot in taxis. <laughs> like, if there is not an automobile based um, business, it's got to be the big box home improvement. So, if you can build a Home Depot in Manhattan, like, certainly you can build a Whole Foods with the parking lot in the back. You know, um, so I, I think it's it's definitely possible for any of these chains to be built differently. Your local developer just might not be used to it yet. Um, and so that's something that I know a lot of communities, and if, if you guys have experience, please 
share are struggling with is your local developer has been developing in your in your suburb for 20 years and it's always been these car oriented strip malls and those work fine and why would I do anything else? And sometimes um, we've had success in in sort of bringing those developers in and having a conversation and maybe showing them some examples of what they, what they could build that would be more profitable and work better for your community. You know, if, if we can fit more retail into the same space because we've built up instead of out. Um, we've had a couple of communities that, that we've worked with that have had success, you know, and helped have really fancy renderings and all that kind of stuff, but um, had some success sort of convincing their development community um, that this is a benefit for them. Um, so that's sort I of I think why. we're seeing that too, too with corporations and where they want to be too. There's like Target Express that is now, you know, placed in a walkable area. There's Walmart, you just forget yep. what they saw for their yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, And then, yeah. They see, they see money, they see profit. Exactly, they see so. profit and they see people moving into these more dense walkable urban areas and they uh -huh. want to be there. Yeah, and so if you've got, you know, if you've got your local Joe developer and you can convince them, you know, look, here are these other models. This is the way these bigger corporations are going to go. And I'm trying to give you, like, the heads up and the, you know, first, be the first one to, to accept this new model and it'll, it'll be more, usually they like that kind of advice. Um, all right, so large setbacks um, contributing to a wide open field. There we go. This is a McDonald's. Um, I think this one's in Seattle too. Uh, the building is closer to the roadway. Just interacting with public space, there's still the parking in the back. And then uh, street furniture. So one of the things that I think is really can be really challenging sometimes is if you you know you see a community that's working well and you want to try to kind of bring those um, those elements into your community. Uh, I'll see big wide open roadways that have. Uh, brick pavers and flags and it's like so those were those were in the other city but that wasn't totally it. Um, street furniture is a good way to attract people and also to still kind of help calm calm traffic but street furniture done correctly. Um, you need to make sure that your benches are in a place where someone would want to sit um, and the trash cans are where people are trying to throw things away. I know that sounds really obvious, but sometimes you'd be like, oh, hey, we have the elements, just throw them out wherever. Your bike parking is, is near places where people want to bike to. Um, so this is, uh, this is from one of the manuals that we did, but we've got space up against the building for sidewalk cafes, street furniture, those, you know, sandwich board signs, um, and then space along the roadway, and then still six feet of clear saturated space. To walk, so just sort of making sure that we've got um, the furniture in the right place can be really helpful. They're sitting under a tree. Um, <laughs> public art. So I don't know if anybody else saw the uh, Dragon Protected Bikeway in Minneapolis. Was great. <laughs> you live right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was actually um, this was actually like guerrilla art. This was not where, a city. Where is it? Where is <laughs> it located? Okay. It's not there. They took it down already, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, and so as a driver, I want to slow down and look at this and what, what is going on here. Um, and then as a, as a biker, I've got really great protection because no one's going to drive across that dragon. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's a lot of ways that you can incorporate artistic elements into your roadway. And I wanted to show you this one and then also the, um, the wraps because it doesn't have to be expensive. Like, you can hire an artist to make you a big monolith to put in the middle of your arterial. Um, that's probably not going to be the right application of public art um, to help with traffic calming. Uh, and then this is, um, City of Minneapolis has a lot of these wraps around their utility boxes. And they have a whole um, brochure online for how to apply to do it. And they've been doing it for a while. So they have all these, you know, oh, it's probably not going to be flat. You're going to have to clean it before you put the thing on and all that kind of stuff. But it's just another way to create a more interesting space. Um, I'm basically also just giving you a bunch of placemaking tools. I know that I said traffic calming at the beginning. Community building. Community building kind of tools. Um, if it feels like a place, people will be more likely to treat it like a place. And so just sort of making those incremental changes to try um, 
do that will also help bring your um, bring your traffic speeds down. Any questions on any of the toolbox items before we move on? This has been really interesting for me. Oh yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm just thinking about how uncomfortable it is to sit on a bench that's pretty close to the curb, looking out to the street, because your back is to the sidewalk. Most people feel a little nervous, like walking back. And yeah, back, and yeah. And then you're close to the flash. So, so I thought this design is big. Yeah. You don't see that very often. The uh, well, it, it takes up more width. It takes up more width. Yeah. But, and these people are back to back against the tree, but the other one I actually see is two benches facing each other. Like people might want to face each other while they have a conversation. Yeah. Like you know? Um, yeah. The other thing is, looking at city code, if you don't have it codified that the, the benches are not solid concrete, so snow falls through flat, and the material involved, or even that you don't allow any kind of advertising or you control through a franchise fee. Um, if you're waiting for counties and MnDOT to do it, it's a very haphazard licensing procedure. You're not going to get that picture whatsoever. You're going to get your old boyfriend, the state farm insurance guy, you know, on, on a bench followed by, um, you know, a pseudo attorney kind of thing in concrete and poorly maintained and not necessarily a place where you want them. Right. And yeah. So that once that starts happening, that way lies madness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what one of the uh, um, I'll, I'll call this. Uh, <laughs> and, and do I have a specific example like Fridley in mind? <laughs> 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 My real turn on was a mention by one of the farmers that we, that we frequent. And so, well, hey, James. <laughs> there are good benefits of the street. Right, yeah. Um, so, one, just another kind of comment on, on uh, furniture, and I'm going to call this sort of like uh, challenge mode with respect to furniture, but uh, people really like to be able to move the furniture. And so, if you have a public space, not necessarily a street, but a park or something, where you have chairs that people can pick up and move around, like we don't have to dictate to people where they sit. You know, they can. Uh, of course, the um, other impact of that is that then your furniture could move oh, away. Scrap metal. You know, <laughs> so you need to have the kind of space where that's um, that's feasible. But that's something that, with respect to park design, we're really trying to encourage folks to do is to have movable furniture and have people. You know, I've set this seat for myself here because this is where I want to be, and I'm going to stay longer. And then interact with the park more. So, okay. Um, so making the case uh, for traffic calming and alternative modes, um, because I didn't know which one of these you guys would pick, I wanted to make sure to use this quote more than once. Um, if you plan cities for cars and traffic, you will get cars and traffic. So this is a report from the Frontier Group again um, from 2012 called Transportation in the New Generation, Why Young People Are Driving Less and What It Means for Transportation Policy. Um, I am technically a millennial. I'm an old millennial, well, early 80s kind of millennial. <laughs> um, and so it's been really interesting listening to folks talk about, talk about the millennials, talk about the children of the baby boomers and, and how it might be different than our parents and, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of information about millennials wanting to travel in different ways. Um, and so, you know, depending on the demographics in your city, if you are looking to attract younger people, um, having a transportation system that provides them with options is going to be an important way to do it. Uh, so this data is getting a little bit old now. This is from 2001 to 2009. Um, but the uh, annual vehicles, vehicle miles traveled by this demographic group went down 23%. So I told you that 10,000 DMT average, um, this group was down to 7,900. So still driving, but definitely choosing to travel by other modes. Uh, they took more bike trips, they took more transit trips as a result. Um, there's been an update to this document, October 2014, Millennials in Motion. Um, <laughs> same kind of thing. Uh, the graphic from the previous one was better, so I left it. Uh, this is also a research project um, that a friend of a coworker did. This is really interesting. This is the four types of millennial travelers. So they really kind of dug into how the younger generation is wanting to get around. Um, we've got 14% carless 
and then 4% multimodal, and that's where I fall in. Folks that have a car but choose not to use it. So between the two, 18% um, of your population is still not a huge amount, but as you can, you know, as time passes and the boomer generation continues to age out, millennial generation um, becomes a larger percentage of the traveling population. Uh, this is this is definitely the way the way it's going to go. So the American dream of owning a car and, and driving to a house with a two-car garage is not necessarily something that appeals to the younger generation. Um, so this one, I'm sure that you guys are familiar with Walk Score. Um, we have some research that shows that property values increase between $700 and $3,000 for each additional point on Walk Score. So, you know, we're talking about um, building sidewalks because it's the right thing to do, and um, having, you know, having conveniently located businesses because it helps reduce travel speeds. It also brings up property values, which I think most homeowners are interested in. So. Um, something to keep in mind. And then, um, cities and people thrive on designs that support short trips. Um, and getting back to traditional urban design principles, um, I guess another way to say this is everybody else is doing it. Uh, there are a lot, if you look for it, there are a lot of articles about communities that are setting um, maximum speed limits, uh, 25 miles an hour. You need to also make some infrastructure changes to help support that. Um, one-way to two-way conversions, um, if you have two one-way streets, they can really <coughs> kind of jettison traffic through your city. So going back to a more traditional two-way model, the four-lane to three-lane conversion, um, this is a thing that's happening in other communities. So it's a good way to get some support for doing it in your community. Um, this is probably one of the most impactful infographics that I have. Um, if a pedestrian is hit by a vehicle that's traveling at 20 miles an hour, um, 9 out of 10 will survive. If that car is going 40 miles an hour, 1 out of 10 will survive. Um, there's a concept uh, in, a, in a number of cities called Vision Zero. Here in Minnesota, we're calling it Towards Zero Deaths. So, you know, um, increasing Increasing the chance that the members of your community will survive in the event that they're involved in a crash seems like a good argument um, to me. One of the ways that this happens um, in the in the history section, uh, I have a um, when when cars were first kind of becoming part of our um, public space, uh, folks were actually really worried about it and thought that a car should generally not go faster than a horse can run, because that is what we're accustomed to, um, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, like 15, 20 miles an hour. Uh, actually, it seems like a great idea. Um, but, you know, as human beings, our technology has kind of evolved faster than us, and so we're, we're having to kind of keep up with that. And so at these faster speeds, the research has shown that you're, you, just can't, you just can't take it all in. And so your brain can't process all of that information at that speed. And so what it does is it narrows down like this. And so this is just sort of an a, um, example of what, what a driver can take in at 15 miles an hour and what they can take in at 30 miles an hour. You know what they can take in at 80? It's like a pin. Um, and so if we're building an environment where we want people to go 70 or 80 miles an hour, we need to make sure that there isn't anything out on the sides because they're not going to see it. But that's not what we're trying to do in our communities. We're trying to make sure that they slow down so that they see the things like storefronts. Maybe they want to pull over into the on-street parking and go shopping. They're not even going to notice it if they're going 40. So, um, could, yeah. For that same topic. Um, so if, if the traffic is meant to be going 45 miles an hour and it's going 52 miles an hour, um, and you want to plant the center median with, you know, shrubs and ornamental grasses or whatever, mm -hmm. if trees aren't allowed. Um, so, for a pedestrian that's trying to cross and, and you're trying to make sure that they're seen by people that are going to be making left-hand turns, 
you know, what's the, the, the distance back, if you, if you, like, for planting distance? Mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. Like, is there any data about five to ten mile an hour increments needing to have further setbacks or intersections for planting distances, or any any data out there like that? Yeah, yeah, there, um, uh, I mean, I, off the top of my head, I can't tell you what, what the values are, but definitely based on speed, we usually, when, when we do street design, we usually um, uh, have a, just like a clear sight distance kind of area. So that would be where your, um, your plantings would be much lower. You know, you could still have landscaping, it just wouldn't be tall ornamental grasses or, or trees or that kind of thing. So, um, and it can be, I mean, there's definitely this kind of chicken and egg with respect to traffic speed. Because if people are going 52 and it's supposed to be 45, you do the clear um, sight distance for 52 because that's what they're doing and you want them to see, but then that means that you don't have as many vertical elements and then they're not going to slow down. Um, so <laughs> It's uh, it's you know it's really tricky. I don't have a really good answer for um, that part of it. So if you want them to go 45, should you plan for a 35? <laughs> <laughs> you could. I mean, it it really it again it it depends on the it depends on the context. If you have if you have sort of a classic downtown, if you've got some city blocks, you've already got the buildings, you know that kind of thing. Go for it. You know, I think that there's a certain expectation. That I know, like I I worked with some uh, some small towns in um, in Michigan, and they really had this problem where the main thoroughfare was a state road, and so they'd gotten all these state um, requirements at some point, and so it just was this you know huge like freeway basically. But then they have these buildings from like the 1850s because it was a little rural kind of town, and so how to like undo that? Um, and you just got to do it and do more than one. Thing. You know, plant the ornamental grasses, but then also, um, you know, try to narrow the lane width, um, post a lower speed limit, you know, get the more traffic calming type things you can do, the more successful it will be. Okay, um, so this is uh, um, sort of an example of the fact that this does work. We have this towards zero death um, concept in Minnesota, um, in the Netherlands, in 1972, they basically said, you know what, we've had enough. Um, so the adult fatalities, roadway fatalities, and children roadway fatalities, there's actually kind of a grassroots campaign, stop killing our kids, which is funny because if you've ever been to a traffic meeting at, with like a city council or something, there's always a resident who tells you that your project is going to kill their children. But in this case, it's actually like, <laughs> The argument's in our favor this time. <laughs> um, so, as a result, these, uh, these numbers are from 2012. Uh, so, in 1972, the Netherlands said, you know what, we've had enough. And then here's where we are in 2012. This is um, fatalities per um, 100 million kilometers cycle. Uh, and you can see the orange is fatalities and the yellow is, is injuries. So, it took a long time. Uh, it took 30 plus years, but they made significant changes to their transportation infrastructure and it actually actually had an impact. Um, and then as a result, the type of cyclist that you typically get, um, someone who's more comfortable riding in their work clothes, kind of upright um, cruiser bike, the guy uh, on the right looks like he's going into battle, he's got his reflective vest and his helmet and light. That's kind of how, how I look. <laughs> When I read, um, oh, okay. I was wondering where this stuff went. This is it. Was, it seems like a good idea at the time to give you some options and then try to just do parts of it. Um, uh, we talked about the forest reconversion, the benefits of that, some of the vehicle benefits to that. Whenever I can make a case that something is better for cars, I feel like it is better for bikes and pedestrians, and it is better for communities, and it's, all of that is great. But it's also better for cars, and, and you want to. Me to focus on cars, so it's better for cars. Um, so, uh, rear end crashes um, with folks waiting to turn left, no longer an option. Left turners can get out of the way. Um, had that swipe, side swipe one already. That's the big one. Yeah, and then this is that, um, from a vehicle standpoint, that, that multiple threat 
um, lecterns are capped in or have in here. Okay. So this is the again the, the four line to three line conversion. I waved my hands to show you this one, but then this is actually um, just a graphic kind of illustrating how if you only have one lane of traffic that pedestrians have to cross, um, it's a lot safer for them to do so. So that is and the other thing that in the presentation I saw was the property owners trying to access that road, whether it's single family residence or commercial, by having that lane that police can also stop people in, they can nose out into traffic, which they can't do if it's four lanes through the curb. Mm -hmm. So it's actually safer for them to assess whether they can safely enter mm -hmm. the roadway. Yeah. Yeah, and with respect to um uh property act, you know, if you do the four to three conversion and that gives you an opportunity to put in some mediums and plant some trees, uh, but then where you have the median folks can't turn left anymore. So you do have a little bit of uh um have to kind of look at where your driveways are placed and, and how to negotiate that kind of stuff. So, okay. Well, that was the, the three of the five topics. I think that that, that was a good um, selection. So, what, what do you guys want to talk about? Questions? Yeah. So, um, I, I work for the Metropolitan Council, but I have worked for several cities in a municipal capacity as a consultant. and. Um, Great toolbox, love it. Um, you don't speak like a lot of engineers, I know, so <laughs> I just want to throw that out first. The second thing I'm is... I'm assuming that's a compliment. <laughs> uh, it's a great compliment that you speak more like a planner. Um, you think you know, think more like a planner. My my kind of challenge that I've run into in the past is not that you know you have a charismatic elected person like, yeah, we're on board, we're going to make this happen, or you don't have the tax capacity to do it, but that you have a... Um, public safety uh, chief or a fire chief was like, yeah, the one time we're going to drive down there in the next 40 years to put out a fire, we can't get the truck, we can't turn the truck around after the fire is done. So I, the, my frustration has been that that carries a tremendous um, force in public safety. I'm just sort of wondering about other, you know, we're on the same team, but they're kind of undermining what I'm trying to do. So just if you just to kind of address that yeah. institutional kind of. I mean, I mean, the, the fire chief always wins. Right. What are you, you going to say? You know. Um, and I, uh, can they get a smaller truck? Like, who sold them yeah. such a big truck in the first place? Um, for one. And then, um, the, from, from a public safety standpoint, um, I, I think that our public safety officials are extremely talented and they'll adjust. You know, I've definitely had arguments before where, like, well, you're increasing the delay for motor vehicles by, 10 seconds at this intersection, and 10 seconds could mean the difference between life and death. And you know what? If if it happens, it happens. If more people start driving, and that increases the delay by 10 seconds, they'll they'll adjust. So what? Oh, just um, toward that same topic, the mini roundabout that the fire truck can get, go up and over because it's not planted or mm -hmm. smaller. Mm -hmm. You know, any any data about that? In relationship to you know fire trucks and zoning traffic. Yeah, we do. Um, with uh, with so what she's talking about is with respect to a, a roundabout design, either a full roundabout or a little one. Um, you'll have what we call a truck apron on the outside, and so that could be a brick paver. It could be something that looks nice and is uncomfortable in a regular car, but that your semi drivers or your fire truck can just can just roll right over. Um, definitely. Uh, you know, mountable curves too. You've got like your straight face curve, or you've got kind of at an angle. Um, that can be another way to kind of accommodate those larger vehicles. Um, you have to be careful that your um, passenger cars don't also feel accommodated by that and end up driving over it. Um, but there's definitely the other thing. So it's hard with emergency vehicles with semis. Um, when we run a turning, we call it a turning template when we're doing a roadway layout. The slower the truck goes the tighter the turn it can make. Um, and so it can be a little bit um, frustrating for a, a truck driver who knows he can blow around this corner at 40 miles an hour to have to slow down to 20, but he can still do it at 20, and you wanted him to slow down anyway, so only a couple seconds extra, you know, just sort of kind of considering um, considering that aspect of the design. Yeah. Well, you know, I think of a long-term project that Congress for the New Urbanism did, and there's a whole page about sort of, uh, well, actually the data um, that uh, 
public, you know, fire and police people, um, sort of, uh, sort of research that was done in, in concert with, with planners. And so it's posted on the, I think under, in green stuff, I think it's under 14, I think it's a, it's a traffic calming uh, best practice. Mm. But it's a page, and the, the point they make is that if you have, if you have sort of high speed roads, you're killing more people just because of road death than you're, um, uh, if you're in the conversation, thirty seconds. Yeah, it's a whole fire. Okay, the, the concern about uh, if we don't have high speed roads, I'm gonna we're gonna kill more people in house fires. Well, in fact, you the high speed roads kill more people by the south road. Uh, so looking at the sort of total, total system in that. Yeah, that's that's a really good way to look at it. Um, one of the other. Uh, um, topics that I, I sometimes talk about is actually street networks in general. Yeah, and that's, yeah. Yeah, and so if you have this sort of like classic functional classification, you've got one giant arterial and everything kind of spins off that and nothing connects except for the arterial, if that arterial is blocked, yeah, you're screwed. <laughs> and so if you have more a more redundant network and you have, you know, more options for how people can get around, um, and so maybe that's, maybe that's, you know, the kind of the, um, the net positive that you can get with respect to emergency response. You add more ways to get there, but then maybe slightly delay one of the rounds. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of questions from the webinar. One of them is what tips do you have to get your public works team on board with more trees, plants, and green space since it would be more maintenance time and cost for them? Yeah. Um, I'm a private consultant. I don't have a really good answer for <laughs> how to how to pay um, pay people to maintain stuff. Um, you know, it's a little bit philosophical. I, one of my coworkers tells a story um, that he was looking to uh, to redo his living room, and so he he wanted to get a vinyl floor and a concrete couch. Um, and then he could just hose it down, you know. <laughs> and uh, his wife wasn't into it, and he didn't understand why. And and so it's you know. <laughs> This is the community that we want to have. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about volunteer efforts with respect to, to snow removal and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is one area that you can make tremendous strides by the use and generate, or you know, um, working with the University of Minnesota to create uh, volunteer tree steward groups. There's training available. And uh, this is something that I was kind of like, oh gosh, it's going to be so much more staff time, and it's still embryonic for for Fridley. But uh, being able to get trees planted through volunteer, corporate, or service groups, and then having them pruned and trained or winterized, uh, it turns out a lot more people are interested in it than I would have ever suspected. And Public Works has grudgingly said uh, that tree planting thing. That's worky, and it was painful <laughs> for them to say it. They don't still so want water it, and watering is not solved yet. But it's it's doable, yeah. and it's it's the university, it's the DNR. I mean, some of these state agencies and the university are coming together to help make these things happen, and it 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 really can work. Yeah, and I um I've seen uh, like adopt a median. You know, they got like adopt a highway where people pick up trash, but adopt a median where folks say. I'm going to maintain the landscaping in this for the for the summer months. Um, you mentioned you have your garden in the in the boulevard, right? Same kind of same kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right in the back. I know the, the town I went to college, and they had people in the town drive around in a gator with a big water tank and water all the plants along the street. It's a very small town, but still got a kick out of it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, jumping from the concrete couch, it's like some people like granite countertops, you know, extravagant, nice, beautiful in their kitchen. Well, trees, you know, it's, it's, it's just a value thing. It's like, you know, and, and, and there, I mean, yeah, I have a, a whole other presentation on the, like 21 benefits of street trees, but like they have a cooling effect, right? They create shade. You don't have to run your air conditioner as much if you've got shade trees that are, you know, so there's like, there are other co-benefits to having trees. Yeah. Hey, you know, speaking on behalf of the trees. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's not the first time you've used that, is it? Okay. <laughs> Usually up on a stump. Um, not all trees are high maintenance. 
matter of fact, most trees are not high maintenance. It's the poor selection and poor placement. And poor selection usually starts with non-tree people selecting the species. And most of the time species are selected uh, based upon are they easily available? Do they grow fast? Are they cheap? One of the worst things is will they grow in any lousy environment? That's why we overplanted green ash in American elm. Um, are they red in the autumn? <laughs> <laughs> and so by by having it's like anything else. You have engineers make engineering decisions. You have uh, tree people make tree decisions. That could get rid of a lot of the problems. And one of them that Kay brought up earlier, too, is this obsession with height and median areas. Um, that's not the problem with trees. You just pick a tree that grows tall enough that you can raise the branches. Make it stay under it. Yeah, exactly. So it, it, it is a matter of really poor selection, poor placement, and uh, this obsession with the wrong thing. And compacted soil. Uh, it's just, you know, there's tons of different things. Yeah, why don't you plant, or why don't you pour concrete sidewalks that are one inch thick? <laughs> I mean, it's the same mentality. Somebody may say, oh, yeah, concrete is concrete. This isn't rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I can just offer a little bit of advice to that question about working with public works. I think it's important to bring them in as soon as possible and not wait until it's time to maintain anything to, to have that discussion because it's most likely that they do understand completely the underlying benefits of it. So it's just that they have to make adjustments within their own department to prioritize that new that maintenance of that new project. And that's where your city manager is hopefully going to be helpful in bringing your two departments together because planning and engineering are, and public works are always going to have this kind of rub where public works feels like planning just makes these grand visions that they have no idea how hard it is to actually do the work and implement it. So bringing them in early is important. And then some the tactic I use a lot is just to kind of like in, in building rapports to kind of like friendly blame the community while the community really wants this. Like, we have to do it. The community wants it. It's not me. It's not, I didn't do it. I'm, I'm just saying it. I'm just saying the community really wants it. So we got to find a way to make it work. And Or I'll blame the council a little bit, but like in a, in a nice way, not in like a, you know, not in a rude way or something. Yeah, but the top, it's, I do. Yep, it's like, yo, I'm just following direction and we got to follow direction together. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> So sort of to build on that, um, if you can help someone feel like it was their idea um, and give them agency in the decision. So, you know, city council told me I have to do this and can you help me make it the most like efficient thing? You know, do you, can we call your tree guy? Can you get your tree guy to tell us what trees will be the least work for you? That kind of thing. So. Uh, one other thing that I'll add is, you know, that council we had worked up last month on resilience and um, it's encouraged to include resilience in your plan and your green infrastructure trees are a huge part of adaptation and stormwater mitigation metrics to include as well. And so cities start to have those goals just come into the conversation and then, you know, I, I would just imagine for public works it makes your job more interesting to not do the same old sort of concrete thing all the time and, you know, add a little color into it. Yeah. So. And I, I, you know, um, sometimes folks have been doing the same thing for a very long time, and so, you know, kind of worst case, when does that person retire? <laughs> you know, like yeah. some, sometimes you just really can't bring people along, but it's not going to be forever. So, <laughs> what else? Cool. Yeah. I guess similarly, I'm looking for tips on how to work with county and state in terms of their infrastructure in our communities. There's, there's just never that communication aspect. Um, and we want to start building that in terms of planning for the community as a whole. What county are you? Sherbert. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, got a, I got really good head of county recommendations, but that's, that's not helpful. Um, I want to ask, I want to know what other. I got one there. idea is. To, um, the relationship with the county commissioners can go a long way. If the county commissioners are giving direction to their staff to make adjustments to the facilities, that has worked in Golden Valley. And if they're the wrong political persuasion and they're in the minority, then yeah. they're hosed. <laughs>
But like, but that's a great. I mean, that's a great thing because Hennepin County and the city of Minneapolis green paint to try to get bicyclists across. You know, I brought it up in Hennepin County transportation. They're like, well, we're not going to. You can't. We're not using any green paint. Like, well, why not? Or what's the alternative? Or do you have a different right, right. thought about getting yeah. bicyclists across these intersections? Not so much. Yeah, one of the things um, when I was working in Michigan, uh, folks had um, sort of similar frustrations with, with MDOT, and it was really challenging because the um, head of the department had come out and said all these really great pro bike things. He was a bicyclist. He was like, MDOT is changing and we're going to do this. You know, but then as you trickle down to like the local level where the, they're more involved in the day to day of actually getting stuff done, and they've been doing stuff the same way the whole time. Sort of the analogy I gave is that the DOT was a very large ship and we had only recently started to turn it um, and that it just takes a while either from the bottom up or from the top down for everyone to sort of have the same perspective. And that was something that was really frustrating for the public was they would hear from an individual that worked for the department that was on board with all of these kind of new, not old ideas, really, new ideas, and like, yeah, we can do that. And so I heard from the DOT that we can do that, but then the DOT guy that I actually have to talk to for my project isn't interested. And so it's just, you know, it just takes time. The, the county and the state are not one person, right? There's a lot of people that work for that same entity, and it just takes a while to get them all on the same page. If you can find someone from within that agency, like your commissioner or, you know, someone from a different, um, in, in Michigan we call them TSCs, but a different TSC that said, hey, you know, in Lansing we're doing this, it's kind of working out, can we talk to you about how to do it in Detroit and, you know, get that kind of cross-pollination within their organization, I think they'd be more, um, hopefully more open to that, so. Okay, look at that, blowing the clock. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just one more thank you for Hannah and Emily. Those were really great. And, uh, and I want to thank all of you. I think that was one of the better discussions that um, I've been a part of and heard uh, in these workshops. So that was really good. Um, so thank you all. And thanks to everybody online as well um, for their participation. Too. Um, and, you know, just a point on what Hannah is saying, you know, talk to each other. Go to the best practices, look and see who's doing what and call up those communities um, and just learn from each other and try to, you know, the more communities that do it, it's going to be easier for those communities to follow behind you and get it done too. Um, so our next workshop is going to be January 4th. It's going to be a whole new year. 2016 will be over. <laughs> um, so community engagement, we'll get the agenda out hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, and registration will be online. Um, and we'll be able to make it either in person um, or on the webinar. So thank you all.